Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks by the New Art School. Our guest today is Bradford Hansen Smith. He's come back for the second time uh, to share even more insights into the wonderful world of folding and geometry. So we're very well welcome. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad, for coming. Thank you, Lateris. It's um, it's nice to be with you again. So were you saying about the theory? You were, we were talking about the theory before. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you had mentioned that there was a lot of theories behind the folding that I do. And theory, is, uh, as far as I can tell, is one of those problems that we have, is that we theorize about things, and then we try and bring that about. We try to prove it. And all of the theories that I have the philosophical underpinnings mm. are my observations of what happens in the circle. I'm not using the circle to demonstrate the theory. Mm -hmm. I'm folding the circle. I'm observing what it does. And, you know, there's, a, there's kind of a theoretical aspect that just emerges from that. Yeah. So, um, I mean, <laughs> we go back to Euclid which is primary to how we teach geometry today. And we're, we're trying to, you know, get away from it, but we can't so far. It's too embedded in our whole cultural system of logic and how we think about things. Euclid had a theory. The point has no attributes. We, we hold to that theory today, that we're looking at locations of, of energy, of you know something happening in space. We don't see it. We don't know anything about it. But we assume that it has no, no properties, no physical attributes. OK, that's a good theory. And it's, it's held true. But what did he do? He went and he got his compass and he drew a picture of a circle and he drew a picture of a point and he drew a picture of a line. And yet his theory said, there are no attributes to the point. The lines are made up of points. There are no attributes to the points. So the line doesn't have any attributes and the circle is made up of points and lines, both of which have no attributes. So then can we assume that this picture really represents what he's talking about. It doesn't demonstrate his theory because we don't draw circles using points and lines. We use a compass. And that supports the theory of the center of the circle, which is that common nothing that, that all that other nothing has a, a line relationship to, which is nothing. So where do we go with that theory? He found a way to demonstrate it. And then we've been trying to prove all aspects of those attributes that he said initially don't exist. Um, and we accept this without question. And so when I started the folding circles, it was like, there's no place I can go to find somebody who can tell me what I'm going to find when I draw a circle. It's going to tell me what's there. It's going to be a lot of people who tell me what they've put into the circle through construction. But there wasn't anybody out there who could tell me what was in the circle inherently. So I had no theory to go on except it's whole. It's complete. It's unity. And if it's unity and it's whole, then everything is in there. That's the theory. And I've been spending, you know, about 45 years now trying to find the one thing that doesn't fit that theory that's going to blow it apart. And I still haven't found it. Now, I don't know everything, but every time I come across something that relates to geometry or math or the, the, um, primary functional relationship of things, of people, I try and plug back into the circle because if it's not there, that blows my theory apart. Mm. But so far, 
I haven't found anything that doesn't one way or another plug into folding the circle. Um, when I tell, you know, when people ask me what I do and I say full circles, why do you full circles? I say, because it's a pole, everything's in there. Well, what do you mean by, you know? So I can tell right away as I talk that they're beginning to think I'm one of these snake oil salesmen who's going to tell you this bottle of liquid is going to fix all of your problems. Doesn't matter what your problem is, it's going to fix it. So math people hear me say, all you got to do is follow the circle and you know math, you know geometry, you got it. We don't believe it because one, people exaggerate what they're trying to get you to buy, whether it's an idea or a product all the time. We're used to that exaggeration. We just slough it off. That's why it's so important to fold the circle because then you find out what is there that's of value to you. And I've found daily, I find things that are of value to me in folding circles. That's why I do it. And I can't, I can't tell you I can't give you all of that, but I can give you some basic things that I've observed in terms of the sequence of folding and what that generates that allows the circle to reveal what is inherently there. I mean, last, last time when we took two points on the circumference and put them together, you realize how extraordinary that is? Any two points on the circumference and you put them together will fold it exactly in half. How does that happen? I didn't design it. I didn't theorize that's what's going to happen. You know, I just did it to see what would happen. What's interesting is that I know about folding circles just like everybody else does. You put the edges together and you crease it. And I did that for a lot of years before I realized, what am I doing? follow through what what's your first thing you do well i i take an imaginary point on one part of the circumference and i put it with another imaginary point on the another part of the circumference that folds it in half and so i said well that's interesting so i tried all different combinations of points and they all fold it in half that's not my doing how does that happen that Right there is, to me, the magic of the circle. Then when you, when you mark those two points and you see four, four points, two points of the diameter, two points you marked, this is amazing because all you got to do is connect them with these lines and you have a quadrilateral. You have all that being able to see that quadrilateral by connecting those line points with a line allows you then to see what you didn't see when you first folded in half, which is a tetrahedron. See, so it takes recognizing what we don't see, giving it a form that makes sense to us, it gives us meaning, and that reveals more information. Now, what it reveals, I didn't put there. It's just there inherently, but it's my job to observe it. So all of my time folding circles has been about observation. It has not been about what the circle does or the fact that it has all this information. I mean, I have no, no math background. After the, after the seventh grade of one semester of algebra and one semester of geometry, I said, that's it for me. I've learned my math from folding circles. So for me, that's a demonstration of the beauty of folding the circle. Is I get to learn things that I didn't know before. I've had too many teachers come up and say, you know, if I had learned this when I was a student, it would be so much easier. Yeah, but you know it now. Take it to your students. Well, I can't do that because the books don't talk about folding circles. And my principal, my advisor won't allow me to, you know, bring something new into the classroom when we're not even studying what we should be doing. 
See, we've got a theory that says math is what it is. And then we spend centuries proving that theory to where we believe that it not only is a theory, it's an absolute. Yeah. But it's not. It's just a theory. And that's the trouble today. Too many people say, I got a theory about quantum physics. This is my theory. And then it gets published and we all believe that's part of the discipline of quantum physics. Yes. Which goes back almost a century. Yes, because there's, 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 there's two words for it. One is an axiom and the other is a theory. Yeah. <laughs> so they need... <laughs> So anyway, this, <laughs> this is not where I wanted to start. Where I wanted to start was your comment about paper plates being thick and hard to fold. And I suspect that's probably the case for a lot of people. In fact, a lot of these people around this planet don't have paper plates. They're just not available in their culture, in their community. So... How does that, that leaves them out in folding the circle? No one doesn't. If you can find a scrap of paper on the, on the ground somewhere, you can do what the circle does. And it's that, that conflict we have about whole and parts. Mm -hmm. If the circle is whole, to me, that means everything that we know about anything and everything we don't know and all that stuff we'll never know is inherent in that circle. We know what it is to put parts together and make quote a whole, something that is coherent, something that has no nothing left over. It's, it's all together. We call it whole and we know how it got there by putting parts together. So we know and we understand that concept of the parts in the whole but we don't understand the whole in the parts. How am I a part of humanity, the whole of humanity? I don't have all that experience of where we've been or where we're going, but within me, I have that because I'm part of the whole. And if I'm part of the whole, the whole is part of me. So if the circle is whole, then every shape, every form, every polyhedron, every polygon is inherent in the circle. So then it's like, okay, I can show the parts in the circle just by folding the circle. Got points, lines, planes, areas, combinations of, we can get all this stuff that we construct otherwise. But then the question is, how do we see the circle, say, in the square, or in the triangle, or in the pentagon? Those are all straight line images. They can't make a circle because we've been indoctrinated into 2D curved lines, circles, straight lines, totally different. You cannot go from one to the other. In folding the circle, what's, what's the first thing you get when you fold it in half? Straight line. Yes. No separation. Straight line, curved line, they're together. Compass and straight edge. That also tells us that there are three parts. two half circles, and one line of division. So right away, I have to look at mathematics and go, zero, one, two, three, four, very linear, progressive. And when I say, when I suggest to people, maybe we can also go from zero to three, makes no sense. Where's one and two? can't leave them out. They're part of what we understand to be absolute. 
Yet, you know from your own experience, take the, the zero of the circle, there's nothing in there, and you fold it in half, and you get two halves, and you have one diameter, one line of division. Three parts. One doesn't exist without two, and two doesn't exist without one. See, so I can make a theory about that, counter to what we believe math is and arithmetic counting is all about. I don't have to because I see it. It's there. And it's there for anybody to see. Then the question is, am I open enough and willing enough to accept something that is beyond my belief system? And that's the hardest thing to do, is to believe that this is not a circle that we draw and Euclid defined for us. It is something else. And what else is it? And am I willing to put my beliefs, which change all the time anyway, put them aside for the moment and just observe what's there? So... <laughs> With that said, you have uh, you have some paper. You have some copy paper. Yes, rectangular paper, any yes. kind of paper. Okay. Um, so we're going to proceed to discover the whole the part, the circle within the rectangle. So I want you to fold that circle, I mean, that circle, fold that piece of paper, just anywhere. Anyway, it doesn't matter where. Put a fold in it and crease it. Yep. Okay, good. Now, have you got a, like a pen or a pencil or something that's got a, uh, a sharp point? Uh, you asked me to bring some scissors. Uh, just something with a point. Oh, something with a point. Yes, okay. I mean, hold on. Yes. Okay. So while it's while your paper is still folded, I want you just to put a point through that paper. Ah. Ah. Okay. So you got... You got a point all the way through. Yeah. Okay, open it up. Tell me what you see. What do you see? I see a line and two points. A line and two points. That's pretty general. Can you... <laughs> Okay, so you see a relationship between them. Yes. Which is? Well, it, it's, it has the, the paper, it separates the paper into, into other proportions, into other areas, those two points. Yeah, they're not half, but they're in two parts. Yes. Yeah. And what's that relationship to the two points, the two, the two holes? Well, they're symmetrical to the line. Right. So we, we see that symmetry is the first thing we get. Yes. Regardless of the shape of the paper. Isn't that what happens in the circle? Yes. First thing you get is a line of symmetry. So that tells us that one, folding is, I mean, it's, it's about symmetry. When you think about symmetry in terms of 2D and how we teach it, it doesn't start with symmetry. We have to start with shapes and then we organize those shapes and then we we talk about symmetry in terms of, you know, flipping over. 
flip it over, it's the same on the other side, a mirror image. Or a rotation, it rotates around and it finds another position where it's the same, same orientation. You know. Then we've got sliding. You can take this orientation and slide it over here, and it's the same over there. You know, so so we've got slip, turn, and slide. That's, that's how we teach from the get-go, very young children, about symmetry. When in fact, every child who's ever folded anything has the experience of symmetry. They just it hasn't been, they haven't been allowed to see that because they're being told it's something else. First thing the circle does, it creates symmetry. It doesn't create a center point. It doesn't create a diameter, a radius. It creates a, a diameter and in your circle, it, it, there's no diameter because there's no circle. I mean, in your rectangle. Yes. There's no circle, so there's no diameter. But the function is the same function. It divides equally between two locations. Taking that further, what is the, can you talk about further the, the relationship between the two points and that line that divides down the middle? Yeah, it creates another line. Those two points define another line. Okay. Uh, that, is, that in my case is, is uh, vertical to the, to, the, to the other one. Okay. So you're, you're saying that, it, that there's a line connecting the two points. Yes. Let's fold that. Okay. So all you need to do is you just need one point. If you line up the line that's already folded and you line that up, and you put it right to one of those holes, increase it, you'll find it'll go right across through the other hole. Yep, absolutely. You got that? Yep. Now, now what do you have? You've got more. See, this is, you saw something, but now you've actually created a form of that relationship between those points. So now what does that give us? We have an increase, it gives us more information. Yes. Yes, what? <laughs> See, that, this is what's, what's so interesting because um, you said, yes, there's more information. We can acknowledge that there's something there that wasn't there before, and it gives us more information. That's not an observation. That's just seeing yeah. what's there. The observation is, what is the yes represent? Well, what we, have, we, have, we have divided our initial rectangle into four more rectangles. Uh, yeah. And okay. then we, we also have also discovered new ways that we can fold the paper again. Uh, it's it, it just the paper's guiding us with, a different, with different shapes. Yeah, so we've got a lot of possibilities in reforming it. Yes. But in terms of the, rela the relationship of those two lines, we have a right angle function, right? Yes, in, in, in this case, we have, we have. It's perpendicular. Mm -hmm. In all cases of any... What you've just done up to this point, in all cases, it will give you this perpendicular bisection. There's no way you can get anything but a right angle. And see, this is this is where this is where then you might make a theory. Okay, my theory is <laughs> that. Any two points on that paper, when I put them together and crease it, will give me the same thing. So I fold a whole bunch of pieces of paper, putting a dot through there, you know, putting a point through there. So we got, to, and lo and behold, the same thing happens over and over and over again. So I'll catalog that in the back of my mind as just a theory holding out for 
some point I'm going to fold something the same way and it'll be different. Then that blows my theory apart. Mm. But I can, only, I can also go, well, I've done it 450 times and it's all been exactly the same. Is that enough to establish my theory? Or do I need to do it a thousand times? Knowing that somewhere there may be an exception. Oh, it depends on the framework that you are judging the theory by, doesn't it? Yeah. So here we have this, this wonderful frame of reductionism. I've reduced it. I've, I've folded, you know, 450 times. So I'm just going to reduce this possibility of there being an exception down to an understanding that is absolute. This theory is absolute. I've reduced it to something without exploring all the possibilities. And that's what we do. Our whole Western science is based on reduction, generalizations, making theories, proving it. All we need to do is prove it once why do so many mathematicians spend a lifetime trying to disprove somebody else's theory? It makes no sense. It seems to me it's, it's, it seems to me it's a waste of their life. For them, it has meaning. It's not a waste. So forget about the judgment on this stuff. It just is what it is. Now, what you folded with these two creases and these two holes you put in. I want you to take a pencil or a pen or something and just connect, connect the dots. So you're gonna take one point connected to the end of that line, connected to the other end of that line, connect the point to the other end. And you're going to trace out the creases that are there. Making any sense? Ah, so you're just connecting. Connect, connect, connect all the points. points okay. Four points. Yeah, connect, connect all the points. Okay. And you're connecting all, which means the two creases as well. Okay. Okay. You got that? Yeah. Okay, good. So I have a kite shape, right? Yes. That's what we folded into the circle, wasn't it? A kite shape, four yes. points. Same thing. Different shape. This is a polygon. Rectangle. Yeah. We fold it into circle. Same thing. Okay, just to take this a little further in terms of observing the information that's here, um, I want you to do something else. On this line you just folded, I want you to make a little mark where it intersects that first crease. Okay. So now draw two more lines connecting that mark to the holes ah. that you produced. Ah. So you have another kite shape, a smaller one. We have a 3D object. What's that? We have a three-dimensional object. A three-dimensional object? Yes. That's the paper itself. <laughs> this is just a drawing. Yeah. Indeed. See, that, that's, that's one, another one of those theories of one, two, three, four. We have 
a two-dimensional image and we see it as a three-dimensional object and it's not, it's still a two-dimensional image. Yes. See, so can we suspend this idea that we can project movement and space into a two-dimensional object? Okay. Most of what we do with 2D is we project movement into it and we project space into it, just like flipping and sliding and moving around to show symmetry. That doesn't happen on a two-dimensional surface. It happens in our mind. Indeed. It's not. See, so this idea of reducing things down to two dimensions, square grid, Cartesian grid, there's no movement or, or change or space involved in that grid. And yet we use that grid to determine things about movement in space. There's a disconnect there because it's projection of the mind. So either we don't need the things in space and we can just use our mind, or we don't need the image, we can just use our mind. But we're not at that point of mind development to be able to do that. So we need the image to make the projection to understand something about space and movement. We're at a time now where our tools are so sophisticated. We don't need this two-dimensional image. We're giving it movement and we're giving it space, a virtual space, but we still call it space even though it may be flat, flat screen, it's a flat image. It has the projection of movement, which gives us the emotional response, the physical response to space. I think we're at a, a period of transition of how to use our minds. <clears throat> and we cannot get off of that two-dimensional plane yet. We haven't figured out how to do it. And the circle is one of those things because it's not a circle, it's a circular disc. Circular disc is the compression of that sphere to a circle disc. It's still unity has lost nothing. It is simply compressed. Mm -hmm. So I think our minds are at the point now in our evolution that we need to decompress all of that information that's there spherically, the unity that's there, we compress down to a flat plane and we make a projection to try and get it off the flat plane. But the only way to do that is to decompress, which is what folding does. So more and more, I hear people talking today about circularity, particularly in terms of social functions. This, it's not linear. It's now circular. Linear, we all lie up in a line. We all get to look at somebody else's back. Right? Mm -hmm. All familiar with that. We went to school. We're familiar with it. Get in line. Stay in line. Don't get out of line. Just keep looking at somebody else's back. Now we know that if we get in a circle and we get to see everybody, all of a sudden the social dynamics changes because nothing is hidden. I'm not just looking at somebody's back, I'm looking at the front of everybody, which means nobody can get away with anything without everybody knowing it. And that's what we're in the throes of today, trying to understand circularity and how we can all gather into a circle, be vulnerable enough to expose ourselves. I can see you. Don't tell me you're, don't tell me this when you're showing me something else. Yeah. Don't tell me you're going to do good for me and you're sitting there pinching the person next to you. There's tremendous social ramifications of folding the circle because it's about circularity. It's about unity. 
And we know that we cannot construct unity because if we're using parts and we're putting them together into something we call whole, those parts are gonna fall apart eventually. Yeah. Because parts aren't static, they're about movement, change, transformation, reformation. Okay, so here we are. Um, let's forget about let's forget about those. Okay. Just focus in on this rhomboid. Yeah. What shapes do you see in that rhomboid? Oh, there's about uh, how many? There's six triangles. This is the frustration and the beauty of the classroom <laughs> is that were you with, you know, 30 other kids sitting around there, they wouldn't let you sit there and hem and haw and try and figure out. They'd, they'd, somebody would say, well, there's triangles. And yeah. you'd go, oh, yeah, there's triangles. Okay. So this is why, you know, back to that collective, that circle, yeah. circularity. There's four triangles. Four, oh, yeah, yeah. But there's also, yeah, there's, yeah. But in fact, there's six, tri there's eight triangles. Yeah, eight, yeah. You got two, the large. Yeah. And then the individual ones. Okay, when we look at the individual triangles, the right triangles, correct? Yes. Does that bring to mind the Pythagorean theorem? Yes. Yeah. How do we... I don't have to prove it, it's right there for you to see. But we need to understand what we're looking at. And the Pythagorean theorem is just a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now we can see that this is a, that's a, they're the same. We have two a's. That's b, we have two b's. That's c. We have two C's. They're all the, th so we've got two A's, two B's, two C's. And we can prove that by how we fold it. So I don't need any abstract idea to prove to you that those lengths are the same and there's two of each. We can forget about this triangle and this triangle because this is a, this again, do you see a difference between these triangles? And even my, even when I'm working with first graders, they go, yeah, one goes in that direction, one goes in that direction. Good, <laughs> so we have a left-handed right triangle and a right-handed right triangle. Yeah. See, we're just trying to clarify what we observe by talking about it. That means we don't need this triangle or this triangle because they're produced by the two right triangles. And we don't even need the two right triangles because this we have twice, this we have twice, this we have twice. So we can say two A's plus two B's equals two C's. Or we can say two squared plus our a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Why square? Because we're talking about a right angle, 90 degrees. And how many of those go around to complete a circle? Four. You can't get five 90 degrees in 360 degrees. So there the math tells us that the Pythagorean theorem there's something about that theory that we could almost say is absolute. As long as we accept 360 degrees as a description of the circle. Yes. We can divide it that way. So when we get into hyperbolic geometry, that changes the game. We're still trying to say, 
490 degrees in a circle, and yet we're adding some more degrees to those 360, it's no longer a circle. Mm. It's a hyperbolic function. So we've, we've, we've raised ourselves off of this 360 degree circle that we draw. And by adding more degrees, it becomes a spatial object. It moves, it's in space, it's no longer flat. There's no correlation. So here we've, we've got people trying to prove the, you know, get a grip on this hyperbolic function of a flat image that doesn't want to do anything but be flat. We got to forget about that flat image of 360 degrees and go, okay, what is it I don't know about this new thing that I can find out that will take me in another place? Doesn't deny the 200, the 360 degree flat circle. It's always going to be there, but it's no longer relevant in the same way. So that first fold, those first fold and those two points. What is your Pythagorean theorem? And all we did was point out what was there, right? We just observed what was there. You don't think a first grader can do that? Yes, of course they can. They can. Yeah. You think they understand the Pythagorean theorem? No, because it's just the word. It's an abstraction. One, you know, I, whenever I do this, I think about my daughter coming home from middle school one afternoon, really upset. And I said, so what's going on? She says, well, in math class, we're learning the Pythagorean theorem. And she's in middle school now. And I says, yeah. She says, yeah. And, and I asked him why it works. Where does it come from? And he said, don't worry about that. Those, that's, those questions are relevant. You need to learn the, the, the formula because that's what you'll be using. So don't worry about any questions you might have. Just learn what I have to, to teach you. And that's what upset her. Not that she couldn't learn it. What upset her was that her questions were rejected. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do to each other socially, not just educationally, but socially. We reject, and then we call those people we reject outliers. Hmm. They're not part of us because they have questions about what we're doing. Well, if nothing else, the condition of this planet to tells us today that we need to question everything we're doing because everything we've done up to this point has not worked. So here we have this wonderful demonstration of information that has been so abstracted that we don't even know what those formulas mean anymore. And, you know, it's a lot to expect somebody who has been educated to understand symbols to make that connection to an actual physical in space moving function. They're different worlds. Mm. They're absolutely different worlds. One may describe the other, but without the experience of the other, what you're describing has no meaning. You can learn it, you can use it, it has no meaning. Okay, this is not what we're supposed to be doing today. We're supposed oh. to be following, right? Um, take another piece of paper, okay. um, copy paper. Yeah. And you're gonna fold it any place, doesn't matter, just put a crease in it. And there's, there's our first choice. I get to choose where I put that crease. 
There's nothing, nobody telling me where to put it. It's my choice. Okay. Now, when we folded the circle, the next thing we did was fold it into thirds, right? Yes. Now we've already folded the square in the what we did before. So this time we're going to fold it into thirds. So okay. Fold. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna look and it doesn't matter where that point is on that line you just crease, but you're gonna you're gonna look for this angle and make sure that all of these things are lined up. And this this will take a little bit of going back and forth, and I find it easier to do on a flat surface. Because then when you get it like this, where you can see that obviously this is not, you know, it's it's not even. That ratio of one to two is a function. So here we're off that much. If we go off the if we go in the other direction halfway, then it's going to be even. So that's an easy way to then figure out. How to get back on without a lot of sliding and slipping and sliding around. And again, this can be as accurate or as inaccurate as you want it. Yeah. Got it? Yeah. Give it a good crease. Um, oh, in the third, you mean, oh, so, sorry, in a point, in a point like this. Yeah. In other words, we're going to take any place on that line, fold this over so that these look even. The angles look even. Then oh. you're going to fold so that I, behind. I fold it, I fold it into, into, th into thirds like this, no? No, 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 no. Okay. okay. Uh, like we did with the circle. Like we did with the circle. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. Let's start again. See, because if we're going to show the circle and the part, we're going to have to do what we did with the circle and not what the part wants to do. Right. Uh, and that's the problem. Uh, so this is a bit... Okay. Um... This, this is the other problem we have with this medium, is that were we in the same room together, you could see what I've done yeah, and then make adjustments to what you're doing very quickly. Um, it's hard to see what I do when I put it down on the table. So this is what you're, you're gonna end up with. Okay, I think, yeah, I think I have something like that, but yeah. Okay. Um, no. Oh, no, no. Where's your first fold? The first crease you put in there? Here. Oh, okay, now you've got, you've got it. Yeah? Yeah. Crease it, crease it really well with your, you have your straight edge from the Yeah, floor. I do, yeah, 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 I do, I do. Okay, give it a really good crease so you can see those creases. Okay. I'm, I'm getting close to my camera because I'm trying to look to see what you're doing and it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, something like this. Yeah. So it's given us three lines that intersect at one point. Yes. 
So fold it back up to a three. Uh huh. This is your point, right? Yeah. You're going to take your point and you're going to go up one of one side or the other. See? Up. So you're just taking that point, lining up with that side, making sure the sides line up and crease it really well with your straight edge. So you've taken this. Yeah. You folded it up to there. Up. You crease it. Any to, to any to any place, any place. What's that? Any place. Any any well any any place. In other words, yeah. When we're looking at this, this is as far up as you can go on this side. Yeah. And this is as far up as you can go on that side. Otherwise, you're losing material. So you only want to go up as far as that those creases will allow you. Okay. Now when you open it up. What have you got? Yeah, we have the same. The same? Yeah. So what you've got is a triangle. Triangle. An equilateral triangle with three bisectors. Wow. How many triangles are there all together? Ooh. Well, then you got to start counting. Maybe. You've got six individual, Maybe. you've got, you know, six more of the large ones. You've got right-handed ones, you've got left-handed ones. So you're using all the information that we got previously and applying it to this to see what's there that wasn't there before. Yeah. Okay, let's fold it back up to this. Oh. Okay. Now we folded that that way, right? Yeah. So let's do it the other way. Take this point and go up this side to the end of that first crease. I'm gonna do exactly the same thing. So we folded this one this way, and then we folded it that way. Um. Does it look like that? So you're just folding this, this point on that side, then you're folding it on that side, coming to the same place. So that gives you, that gives you two right angle triangles. It actually gives you four, doesn't it? You have a small one, two small ones, two large ones. Mm. Okay, I think I need to, to, to do it again because I think we need a, a camera for each of us so we can show yes. what each other's doing yes. so we can yes. see. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Okay, I think now I have this, yeah, which is the third. Okay, I, 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 I used another piece of paper. So I got to the third. Oh, okay, okay. And then you said, okay, so from the third, you go and you fold the edge. You, you, you fold this, you're gonna fold this point up this edge. Up this edge, here. Yeah, you're gonna crease it. Then you're gonna take, open it and fold that same point up the opposite edge 
to the point made by the last crease. So it's, it's a reflective function. What you're doing on one side, you're doing the same thing on the other side. Okay, 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 now I got it. Okay. Ah. Ah, we have the two triangles. Yeah. Um, when we fold it, it's just once it gives us one triangle. So when we do that, <clears throat> then, then you've got two intersecting triangles. Yeah. Which gives you your hexagon star. Yes. Now, um, Let's fold it back to a triangle. Yeah. The first three folds. Yeah. And back to that. All right, now you can see that this point and, and your, your vertex and that point of intersection divide that in half, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's good. So then just take the whole thing and line up the vertex point, and you're gonna fold it in half. Fold it in half, like this. Just fold it in half, yeah. Give it a good crease. See? Now here again, we're not constructing anything. We're using the information we've been given to know what to do next. So it's paying attention, observing and paying attention to what we have. Now, when you open that up, oh, probably doesn't look familiar because it's in a rectangle format. No, it does. It does look familiar. It, it does remind me of what we're doing with the circle. We're folding. Yes, exactly what we folded with the circle. Now, so we can see that, fold it back up. That initial triangle. Yeah. Okay. Now you can see that here. I'm going to make these real clear, so you can see them. So that's what we folded. Yeah. Between yeah. this point and this point will give us an equilateral triangle and three bisectors. Right? Okay. We can cut that straight across, but that keeps us into our polygon mode, mm -hmm. straight lines. So if you have a if you have a compass. Ah, a you, can, you can then set that compass no. to that distance. Do you have a compass? Hold on. And if hold not, on. Hold, on, okay. hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Forget about it. No, it's okay. I can, get, I can get a compass. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Okay. So oh, great. Now I have uh, the compass, you asked me. Okay, so compass and, and just set it, set it for that distance of that leg of the triangle. Which distance? <laughs> can, you, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, I see. All right. So put the point of your compass on that vertex point. Yeah. And then just draw. You're going to draw. Yeah. A curve from point to point. An arc. Okay. Now, that line could be anywhere, but we're trying to refer back to the circles. So if you have a pair of scissors, you can cut it, or if you wanted to tear it, doesn't matter because 
going back to Euclid, he said any number of points that have one point in common is a circle. Yeah. Well, my question at first was, how many points does it take to make a circle? It didn't specify how many. Yeah. And then, of course, it was like, well, it can be an infinite number of points because the larger your circle gets, the further out, the more you can points you can put in. So the question is, how few points yes. to make a circle? And we've seen that it really only takes six points, seven points, six on the outside, one in the center. Yes. Okay, so all this is doing is taking these folds. We'll just cut that. Yeah. And, and we're going to cut the circle. Now, what I've, what I've learned is at first I wasn't cutting it. I was just, I was just tearing it. But what I found is that if you just make a little cut on each side so that you know you're accurately going into and out from that point, and, and then it's a, it's a case of just tearing along that line. Ah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I use scissors like, okay, yeah, yeah. So you did the same thing with the scissors. Yeah. Doesn't matter. I find that tearing works just as easily because you're not worried about all these points in between. You're just worried about these six points that, that are minimum to define the, set, the circle. So when you open it up, you have your circle yeah. with your four frequency diameter grid. It's just that we started from a rectangle rather than a circle, but the folds were the same. We came up with the same thing. Um, usually at this point, I recrease all these lines so that they're really sharp and we can see what we're working with. And any errors that were made can be, re be uh, justified by lining up the lines with itself. A little off, back on. We're going around six times. It's easier to see. Makes it easier to manipulate. Okay. This is the hole within the part. It's what the hole does. The hole is not a thing. It's a process. Unity is a process, it's not a thing. And so, regardless of what the shape of the part looks like, if the process is the same as we see in the circle, it will reveal itself in that part. Yes, I mean, that was always there. We just yeah. made it visible. So now we have a beautiful demonstration of part to whole, holes to part. So wouldn't it make sense then, rather than to go from part to whole, which is what we teach, that's our whole educational system, give you enough parts, you'll put them together into a whole, never happens. But if we started with the whole, not just metaphorically, but tangibly with a circle, and we folded it, then we can fold anything that we want. Yeah. Any theorem, any axiom, any function, you know, it's, it's all there. Now, we can take that and take one of those triangles, and just fold one of the triangles. Now we can see that we've got our hexagon. We, I think we looked at this last time, that, that four frequency, it's not the tetrahedron because it's four frequency. You haven't got a division of this equilateral circle. Let's go back, take another piece of paper, another, another rock. 
copy paper. I've even had kids take gum wrappers because they like the foil on the inside. Wow. And fold those. Wow. It doesn't matter what the paper is. The paper is just the vehicle to show a process. Yes. Okay, so fold it anywhere and then fold it into thirds again, like it did before. Hold on, hold on. Now, I might mention to you, and this is kind of a, a shortcut. Once you have this and you have it really accurate, yeah, and you know that it's just right on. Mark it with a T. That's your template. Yeah. Then you can put this against that edge you just folded. And then you know exactly where to fold the next fold. And then you can crease that and know that that's in exactly the right place because it corresponds to your template. So then you just fold this behind, line up the edges. So it's, it's so you, the benefit of doing it without a template each time is you educate your eyes to sink proportionally. Yes. And pretty soon you get really good. This is, if, if you're doing 60 or 120 of these, you'll value the template. <laughs> okay. Do the same thing with the next fold. You're going to fold it up along one of those edges. You're going to get that right angle trine. Okay, we're going to take a little different tour. We, we've, we've done this, right? Yeah. Now we're going to do this. So we're going to take this point and only fold it as far as it will go coming to this point. So you're creating a small right triangle. Okay, so you're, where, where are we folding the point to? Okay, you, you, folded, you folded this to this side. Yeah, yeah. Right? Now you're going to fold this point to that side. It will only go to that far up that edge because this point is going to stop it. Are we making a, third, a little flat. Wait, are we making a third crease? There's your, there's there's your thirds. I've I've made two creases like before, yeah, like 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 before. Just doing one of those. Uh, a little, a little one, a little one. Then you're doing a little one, yeah. And it, it, it'll, it won't go any further and still be right, right, right. Okay, I got it. See, so here again, do what you're told, and don't try and think about whether it's right or not. <laughs> Just do what you're told. <laughs> Who's doing the telling? The circle, the the paper, the folds, yes. the process is, is yes. telling you what to do. Okay. Now, when you open it up, ah, see now you've now you've got your tetrahedron. Yeah. See now now we can just take and, and fold those, but we can't fold it over the way we do with circle. But, We can't fold a tetrahedron this way because of all this excess stuff on here. Yeah. So there's a number of things we can do. We can cut it off. Yeah. Or we can just fold that going back to, to this. We can then just take and 
from, th from this point and this point, a little cut. Then we can just tear that because it doesn't matter. Points in between don't really matter at this point. We're at such a low frequency. Okay, now, now I can do that. And they don't get in the way. Right. Because they're creating the same thing on the other side. Now we can fold our tetrahedron. Wow. So you folded the tetrahedron from a rectangle <laughs> or from any shape. It's about the pattern of movement that creates the information that moves us forward. It's not that there isn't any ideas that we have about how things are supposed to be. They just are what they are. If we take that and fold it further, we'll get the eight frequency. And you can see where the dark lines are what I've folded in the rectangle. And then because this is a three axial grid, three diameters and everything else is parallel off of that at right angles to those three diameters. Then it's just a matter of folding parallel lines, parallel lines. So here, as you fold those parallel lines, you can see where we've now got the eight frequency grid or the 16, 32, take it as far as you want. Doesn't matter whether you start with a circle or not. But you get more from a circle, as we just found, because this stuff doesn't get in the way. Okay. Wow. Well, here's just an example of. Taking that, and there's your tetrahedron. There's the rest of the circle that gets cut away and thrown away. But if you don't quite disassociate it, you get this, this wonderful thing that happens with this movement of the excess and the thing that we think is most important. Right. So we take. Another example of that is, here's a two frequency tetrahedron. It was put together with four sheets of rejected photocopy paper. And all these things coming out, I just cut them off. There it is, that's what's inside. That's what's inside the, the rectangles. Yes. Again, the whole is in the parts. But it's not a, we're so steeped in this idea of dualism and whole and part and opposites that we don't see all the beauty that works in between those opposites. We don't see the beauty of the diameter as the third component to the two opposite half circles. We just see half circles. Then we say well, one's positive, one's negative. You know, and then with that that perpendicular crossing, we say, well, on the right hand is positive, on the left hand is negative, above is positive, below is negative. Those are all arbitrary. There are ideas and thoughts that don't belong there. They have a purpose at, a, at some point, obviously. They don't belong there any longer. That's not the way we know our world works. It doesn't work in the microcosm or the macrocosm. And it doesn't work in between in that way. And we're finding out why. Is we take what we think is important, put it over here, and all that other stuff that we cut off, put over there, and pretty soon 
we drowned ourselves in all that other stuff we threw away because we didn't know where it belonged. And then we overload ourselves with stuff we think are important. We find out they're not important. We got too much of them. It's balance, balance of movement. So um, let's go back to Oh, let's, let's do another one. Let's just fold the triangle. Go back to just the triangle. If you still got it. Yeah, I do. I'm trying. Um, fold that up. And then just... Take your compass if you want, make sure the measure is the same and create an arc. An another interesting way of creating that arc, you put this flat on the desk and you put your, your, your palm right there as a pivot point. Yeah. Then you can very easily draw a circle that's pretty accurate. Certainly for what we're doing. So we're going to open that up to the circle. Triangle with three diameters, three line sections. And we're going to fold. So give us give a good crease. Where are we folding now? Yeah. Yeah. To the triangle. You're just going to fold your, fold your triangle. Fold the triangle, yeah. And give a good crease. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a, a little tangent here at the moment for the moment. And tangents aren't what you think they are, they're just chords to larger circles. That's all yeah. they are. Um, so we don't describe them that way. See this? It's what the compass does, isn't it? Yes. It's what we just did. Go back to the center. Draw a line that shows where it landed. Draw a line that shows where it landed. Okay, so whatever you think you're doing with the compass, circle does it just as well. In fact, it, it gives you very different information when you start working with it because to use the compass and straight edge requires experience and learning how to do things, how to construct. And here, it's all there. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. Of these seven points, you have six on the outside, right? Yeah. One, two, three. Okay, there's a relationship. There's no matter how many points you have, whether you have six or 600, they all have a specific relationship to each other. The complexity is that our simple minds cannot keep up with what all that means. Yeah. So we've, we've invented a computer that will do that for us, but that doesn't give us the experience or the meaning. It just shows us what we can't do but have the capacity to eventually, you know, achieve that. Yes. So here we've only got six points. We're going to show the relationship of one point to the other. Well, here, first we're going to do this. You see the, the long line and the short line? Long, the short ones come out. The long ones go in. All the way around. So the, the short ones, the short ones come up, 
the long ones go in. It's just an in and out fold. It's the same thing we did with three diameters of the circle at first. It's just a different form now. In, out, in, out, in, out. So do that with yours. You got that? Uh, for the triangle. Yeah, but it's the short ones out. The long, the long lines go in, the short ones go out. Long go in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. Uh, <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. Okay, so you're just taking the, sh the short ones and you're going out and that pushes the long ones in. Kind of like those old things that, you know, when we were kids, we these cootie catchers. You know? Yes, I, I, there's something happening here. I, I, I see what you mean, yes. Let's go in. Okay, yeah, I mean, some, yeah, I've got something, yeah, like, like, something like that. And you want to make sure that your, your curves are on the inside. The curves are on the inside. Yeah. In other words, those, those curves. Right. Now, now, here's another way of showing this point has a relationship to this point. And it's not just the straight line. That's what we're used to. Yeah. So take it and, and curve it around so that those points touch. See where what I've done there? This point goes around, touches there. <laughs> you can do the same thing with each point. It's it's going to in the same direction. Each one is going to touch and it's, it's going to create a little a little space a little circular kind of shape have you got any tape from last time no okay then because you need to attach those right so we make so we make the six the, the yes the up and down and you can use glue or you can use tape or This is what that unit will look like wow. when they're all together. See, here's, here's your three, and then the long points come up and touch the short points, creating Brilliant. this nice opening. It's a very satisfying shape. It's amazing. It's amazing. Okay, here's another one the same way. They're both the same thing. So usually when I find something that satisfies me, I'm not satisfied. I want to make another one, see how they go together, and then make a whole bunch more and see how they go together. So I'm never quite satisfied, even though it's satisfying. Um, they, can, they can go together beautifully like this, just one fits into the other. So, so to summarize, we, we have proven that we can go from the whole to the parts and from the parts to the whole. Yeah. Because we started with the plates, in the first episode, with the circle, we started with the circle, and now we started with a random piece of rectangular paper. Well, this has been tremendous. Uh, no. They go together this way. Do they go again the opposite way? No. Yeah, one, one fits right inside the other. So, because of these openings. So here we have one fitting right inside the other. 
Wow. Now we can take one of those out and that changes the angulation on everything else. We can take two of those out and just leave one. And all of a sudden that changes how they work together. So we have lots of options. Yes, absolutely. But if we get caught in the duality, we don't know what we're dealing with. So this intrigued me when I first came across it. And thought, okay, what about if I did a whole bunch of them of just one out, I mean, one in, and the other two out. So I kept doing those. And this was one of the things that I came up with. Just, you can see that they're, they're all, these are in, then the others the other one is out it's it's open so you can see how that's open and the third one isn't even closed in it's 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 just left hanging out there open so here you've got two you know different ways of reforming without changing the arrangement at all. Here, these are just little ones stuck into each other. Yes. The same form. Okay, so this is just demonstrating some of the variables that you have in putting these things together. And one of the really nice things is the spiral. Wow. And these are just these units. This is one side of the unit. This is what the other side of the unit looks like. It's just that about six of them were all the same size. Then I started reducing that diameter each time down to you know smaller and much smaller diameter. And they're, they're reduced, I don't know. Um, I got so much stuff here, I don't know what, I'm, what I got. Okay, you can just take, when, when we take this and we cut that to get that first length, then we can take our compass and just increments of quarter of an inch, half an inch, eighth of an inch, whatever you want, be consistent in, and that will make it smaller and smaller and smaller. So these units become smaller and smaller and smaller, the same thing. Then when you start putting them together, if I kept it just the same length, it would be a tetrahelix. It wouldn't be a spiral, it would be a helix. But because we've reduced this, becomes a spiral. Yes. Now, that's not about this per se. That's just what you can do with it. Uh, kind of to bring this full circle, so to speak. <laughs> um, I want to show you where that, where the spiral comes into. And we just haven't been looking in that direction. But here's our eight frequency folded circle. And you can see that it's really about the triangle and the bisectors. They're different lengths. Edge length is different than the bisector. So when you look at this, you can see where the bisector of this triangle then becomes the edge length to the next triangle. And that bisector becomes the edge length to the next one. And it goes in the same way. So inherent in the folds that we're doing 
is that that reduction of edge length in relationship to the perpendicular bisector. And that's the difference between drawing one circle. Think about a compass drawing one circle. Yeah. Take a compass and draw two circles, two intersecting circles. Then you're getting that nice vesica where they intersect. Yes. That vesica is the difference between the bisector and the edge length. Everything is interrelated to everything else. We could, we could go on for hours with just starting with where we started and it connects to everything else. And that's the beauty of starting with the circle with young children, is that no matter where that child is, where that mind, how that mind functions, whether it functions to spatial patterns, verbal patterns, musical patterns, whatever, whatever patterned things make sense to that mind, which is basically what they're gonna do with their lives, where it goes, they're gonna find something in that circle that they're gonna connect with. And that's gonna connect them to everybody else holding the circle. And so we are on the same page, but we're all doing different things. We don't have to argue about it. Yes. And we don't have to fight about it. And it doesn't matter who, how you define whole. I've had, I've had some people come up and say, well, if you really want to know about whole, you'd read the Bible. Well, I could read the Quran and find out about the whole too or any number of other sacred texts. We're arguing about other people's ideas and beliefs that we've accepted as our own, rather than finding our own from the get-go. Fuller has an interesting book, Buck Mr. Fuller, No Secondhand God. That's the title of his book, No Secondhand God. And he, it's not a religious book, he just gets into Whatever you believe should come out of your first-hand experience and not somebody else's second-hand information. So if you believe in God, don't take anybody's word for it. Find your own. If you believe that 2D is the basis for everything, find out for yourself if it is or not. Don't take somebody's word for it. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't learn everything that our teacher has to teach us. But our primary function is to learn what they don't know and cannot teach us. And that's a struggle with education right now. How do we get rid of what we're already doing and set up an environment where children can learn what they know and expand on that without having to have this conflict of what they're supposed to know, what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to fit in. If we start from the whole, everybody's already in. There is no fitting. There's just observing how these differences go together. But if we start from the pieces, which we do, and try to try to construct unity, it will never happen. We're starting from the wrong place. Some people say, oh, the whole, that's just too much to even think about. Well, we've been folding the whole circle and there's been a lot of stuff to think about and it has been overwhelming. But it hasn't stopped going deeper and deeper and deeper because everything is interconnected. And if the physicists who say the universe, you know, Baum and many other people have said, it's an interconnected universe. Everything is interconnected. That's what science is showing us. And let's take that for granted and say, okay, if it's an interconnected universe, isolated fragments don't exist. We can't treat things individually as parts and pieces fragmented from the whole. 
we can't take a static object and expect to have to find meaning in it if the system is moving and changing and transforming and evolving. We have young athletes today in all fields of body movement who are doing things that people 30 years ago never thought about. They just thought it was impossible to contort your body in that way or to skate and flip four or five times in the air. Mm. We're evolving. Everything's evolving about the human being except the mind. And we've conditioned the mind to not evolve. We're afraid of change. We're afraid of not doing something right. There is no right or wrong in folding the circle. There's no fear there. It will work or it won't work. And if it doesn't work, then it's telling you something. It's telling you your ideas are old and no longer relevant. Get rid of them and just look at what I'm doing and follow my process. So nature does. Follow my process. I don't want to. I want to use you in the way I want to use you. And we've created a climate condition that won't stop. And nobody knows what to do about it. And that's simply because we did not follow the natural order that we were born into. We decided to change it. We wanted control. And it's the same way with a circle. If you want control of that circle, you want it to do what you want it to do, it will not do it. It'll jam up, it'll stop. And then you get frustrated, you get confused, and then, which is where we are. We're frustrated and confused. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we've probably gone over our time at this oh, point. Oh, it's perfect. It's, uh, it's lots, lots of fun, and uh, you're saying these wonderful things. Thank you ever so much, Brad. Um, we'll reconvene again at some point for a third episode. <laughs> well, <laughs> come up with some more questions about what we've been doing and we'll yeah. take that and yeah. go in that direction. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you ever so much for your time. It's been it's been really it's been really wonderful. Thank you, Latars. I've enjoyed working with you. Have a, have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs>